morning everyone, for those of you who I haven't met in person, hi, uh, I'm Kirsten, I'm a profiter in the Isle of Jura and uh, I also study, uh, I'm an islands researcher, so I study balance and sustainable population profiles in islands uh, with the University of Aberdeen and the James Hutton Institute. So I have much more notes than the people that, that you were speaking yesterday, um, but I will do my best to be as uh, engaging. Um, uh, this morning I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about population issues in crofting communities um, and I'm going to take some time to talk through a couple of different areas. Does it all work? If you like hover over the... It's for some reason, it's doing it on one. I'll try stopping it and start it. Uh, I used to work in technical areas, so you know, it's, uh, the presentation was obviously out having a good time last night, just like a lot of work. Right, let's try this again. Right, it's going to be more back and forth than I thought, so bear with me. Yes, okay, excellent. So, I'm going to talk to you a couple of different areas. We're going to talk about what a balanced population is, uh, what a sustainable population is, and how crofting supports populations in rural and island areas. But also think about if there's an opportunity to develop that further. Is there more than we could be doing? Is there something different that we could be doing? And we're going to look at what other people are already doing in, in a couple of different spheres. And then I'm going to get you guys to do some thinking. It's going to be a bit similar to yesterday's sessions, but there will be a little bit of a difference, and I will let you know that at the end. So some of you guys might recognise the, the idea of balanced uh, population profiles. It's actually mentioned in strategic no um, objective number one of the National Islands Plan, as well as in Scotland's population policy. That indicates how important the idea of balance is in population. It's not just about bombs on seats, numbers of people. It's about having that mix of people in your community that allow it to function on a day-to-day -day basis, but also allow you to look at where you want to go for the future. But what do we actually mean by a balanced population? It seems like an obvious question because we talk about it in all of these policy documents. So we must know what we mean by it. But actually, if you dig deeper, nowhere in any of these policy documents that I've read does it tell you what people mean by a balanced population profile. And it turns out that balance is a bit of a buzzword when it comes to population. Because actually, um, so let's take, let's take a little bit of a second to think about that. Generally, these are the areas that people mean when they talk about, when you in, dig a little deeper, when you say, well, what do you mean by a balanced and sustainable population profile? They tend to relate to age structure, family structure, sometimes gender, and sometimes the, the skills that are in your area. But it tends to start with age and go to families, and then gender and skills come somewhere along the line. But even then, people have a different idea about what they mean by a balanced population, because it can change over time. And that's fair enough, because actually different communities need different things for balance. In one area, you might be desperate for kids for the school, uh, because the school might close down. We had a situation on Jura recently where if we had one more child in the school, we would have had to recruit and house another teacher. So although it's great to be attracting families, there are other issues to be considering too. So balance means different things. And when you're considering this area, there are a couple of other things that you want to think about. Firstly, age isn't a bad thing. When you think about the alternative, aging is pretty good. And actually, age potentially brings with it a wealth of practical experience. And not only that, but the kind of knowledge that you develop if you've lived in an area for a while. It really helps you understand how the community works and how the land works and how things happen in an area. Secondly, young people leave. We can work to provide young people with opportunities to stay in the community if they wish to. That can include education and employment opportunities, but there will be a section of our young people who will always want to leave. And actually, 
that's quite a natural part of a life cycle. It's quite natural to want to go away from your lovely communities and experiment a little bit and do things away from the eyes of your community and learn about yourself and grow. That does not mean that these people lose ties with their communities and it doesn't mean that they won't maybe come back in the future. And I think those are important things to think about. Thirdly, and this might be a shocker to all of you, families don't appear from nowhere. Um, so even in a heteronormative setup, you generally do not move from your childhood home in with your partner and immediately start producing babies. So actually if we're interested in families coming into our communities, we need to actually think about where those families come from and we need to think about actually the wider range of people we might be wanting in our communities to allow that sustainability for the future. Fourthly, and I say this passionately as a single childless person, single people and childless couples can contribute too. Um, and I think that's important to remember um, because actually they have the skills, they often have skills and experience and often they actually have more time than people that are running around after small children. Um, so actually it's really important to think about that balance. It is great and when I, when I talk about these things, this is not at the expense of families, this is not at the expense of young people, but I actually think we need to think more broadly about what we mean by a balanced community. And finally, the reason it's important to remember all of these things is, oh, tension, um, <laughs> this is a national issue. Population concerns are a national issue. With Scotland, Scotland's population as a whole ageing and expected to fall, start to fall after 2028. It's true that that is actually felt more keenly in a lot of rural and island areas which have seen long-term um, sustained depopulation. But the fact of the matter is, Scotland's birth rate is already below replacement levels and actually the most common household in Scotland is a single person household. So it's really important that we remember that if we're talking about balanced populations, if the only objective that we have is more families and more young people, they are becoming more scarce in the population as a whole. And that's why we need to think about balance a bit more widely. So we need to think more carefully about what we mean by balance and recognise that, that we are going to continue to need return migration and in-migration from people from all different walks of life if we want to create balanced and sustainable population profiles. So, we talked about balance. Let's talk quickly about sustainability. It's great you have balance, but, but you know, that's balance for now. Let's talk about like, how that gets sustained. Research points, to, uh, points, us, uh, excuse me. Research points out that areas which have long-term depopulation are going to need long-term solutions to tackle this. Basically, it's not about headline-grabbing initiatives to get a few more people in the door this year or next year. It's about thinking about how we maintain and grow our populations in the long term. And just like balance, a sustainable community will look different from place to place and crucially it will also change over time. Essentially what we mean by balance though is that it's balancing the number of people that a place needs to function versus the number of people that people a place can support. It's also about ensuring that you have the balance of skills that you need to ensure that the community can operate on a daily basis and act on opportunities and challenges that come its way and also realise its aspirations for the future. Sustainability is closely related to the idea of resilience. I am not a fan of the word resilience when it's used as a buzzword by politicians uh, and policymakers who are keen to normalise the idea that our community should always be ready to respond to adversity or bounce back from stresses. However, resilience can also mean the strength of the community and capacity of the community to bounce forward, to, take, uh, to take, make the most of the opportunities that come, that come its way. So, in terms of resilience and sustainability, the key factors that are often talked about are infrastructure, do your roads, do your ferries, do your schools work, are they there, is it supporting population, economy, do you have a reasonable economy, is it diverse enough to be sustainable, and the natural environment, and that includes to do um, things to do with health and well-being, but also the resources that you're able to um, use as a community as well. But 
These are the headline ones that often get talked about. Social capital, local knowledge, and people-place connections have actually also been identified as crucial to the sustainability of communities. These things all take time to develop. So when we're considering sustainability of a community, you need to think about not only factors like age and gender and skills, but actually how permanent and established the community is. Areas with rotating populations of transient workers can appear to be balanced in terms of the skills that they need and the people that are there to do the jobs. But actually, that's not a sustainable approach for the future. So, what's all this got to do with crafting? <coughs> crafting is often held up as the example of a system that helps rural and island areas sustain their populations. We talked about the Shucksmith report yesterday. And in it, it says, people made it very clear to us that crofting helps to sustain population levels because it provides access and a tie to the land, giving people a base from which they can earn a living in a variety of ways. In this way, crofting facilitates a connection to place, a sense of belonging, and a desire to remain on or return to the land. Insofar as crofting can provide an affordable home, some food and income, a good quality of life, and a sense of purpose, we were told repeatedly that crofting constitutes a good mechanism for attaining populations. Certainly, crofting has provided access to land and financial support to allow people to remain in communities where it would otherwise, why, otherwise be more challenging. But is this benefit wide enough, and is it sustainable? So back in the day, I used to go to Small Isles Primary School, Tonjura. And of those that I was at the, the school with at the time, there were six of us back on Jura crofting. Four of those crofters are from the same family. And they had an original family croft that was quite large, and it's been subdivided. Which is great, it's great to have them back. That, fa those, that family, the generation of that family, now have eight children between them, and likely more to come. So the subdivision was great, but you can't go on subdividing forever. So I guess there's another option, isn't there? We can buy a croft. So all of my fellow classmates were able to return to croft on Jura because of a family croft, <coughs> apart from me. The croft was lost in, lost in my family about two, three generations ago. I was keen to croft, but in my 20s, I missed out on a croft in a ballot. In my 30s, I was allocated a croft which a newly created croft, which then fell through on the sale of the estate. For the people from the crofting commission in the room, there were still four vacant crofts that were created at the time that had never been let by the estate, despite me repeatedly applying. And finally, I managed to buy a croft in my 40s, but only after pooling resources with my mother, because she wanted to move home to be closer to my granny. It's great, but it wasn't my first choice. And the reason I had to pull it in with my mother is because the croft came with a house. And houses are ridiculously expensive, one Jura. The latest one just sold the other week for hmm, £525,000. So crofting can play a part in sustainable population levels, but it requires access to land and accessibility of that land to people who want to croft. Chuck Smith's report raised questions about whether a croft was an individual asset or a community asset. I've lost my point. Uh, yeah, no, opinion was divided on that area. Many people value crofting's perceived links to communal or collective activity. And that's also a key part of wider life in most crofting communities. One respondent to the Chuck Smith report said, crofting is part of our culture and traditions with communities that still work together for mutual benefit. The communal approach to life is common in many crofting areas, particularly in the more outlying areas where we rely heavily on each other. And I would argue that this communal support, it's what my uncle calls all pulling on the same end of the rope, um, is the main driver that has allowed populations to remain in these areas for so long. But various forces have prompted a shift 
in the way that land is thought of in our crofting communities, from being something that is part of the wider fabric of life and community to something which is an asset to be bought and sold. And this asset, as this asset has accrued in value, people in some quarters have become protective of what they see as their investment or their inheritance. The only constant in life is change. Crofting has served communities, a number of communities well for many years, but it exists in a changing world. So maybe it's time to consider how crofting can continue to support population retention with, uh, in, and growth within the context of an aging population, an increase in single person households, economic diversification of rural areas, and the intervention of market forces. So, in a minute, in the group exercise bit that you're all really looking forward to, um, I'm gonna get you guys to have a think about how we could be using crofting more effectively to support balanced and sustainable populations in rural areas. But, don't worry, I know you had a nice night out last night, so I'm not gonna make you do this cold. I'm gonna give you some examples. And we're gonna look at how the ways people are working together in crofting communities and beyond to see if there's anything that we could learn from that for the future of crofting. <coughs> I'm gonna start with the idea of uh, working the croft as a collective. I'm a lone crofter. And this, some, this is something that's been interested, of interest to me for a while because I really want to see my food <coughs> being used productively. But just me on my own is overwhelming at times. <coughs> so what do I mean by collective crofting? So by that I mean working a single croft with other people that you are not related to or not in a partnership with. Not kind of the more communal stuff that you see going on across crofts or within common grazing, but actually focusing on one croft and supporting a number of different people. Um, and there are folk out there already doing that. Um, when I was on my Access to Crofting course many years ago, which I can highly recommend, I believe it's run by a very good organisation called the Scottish Crofting Federation, um, I met a group of three friends, uh, one woman and two guys, who were embarking on croft life together. They knew each other, as working uh, from working as tour guides across Scotland, and had talked for an idea about uh, f talked for a while about the idea of crofting together. They didn't come from crofting backgrounds. They didn't come from crofting communities. So it took them a while, like it took takes many of us, to find a croft that was available to them and that they could afford. And when they actually found it, they managed to pool their resources and buy a croft of just over nine acres in Assent. They set about trying to use the land productively, both food both through food production and uh, the creation of holiday accommodation. And they also set up their own tour guide business, gradually developing a model which worked for them, which included rotating between working on the croft and in the tour guide business. That was working really well for them in 2018 and 2019. And of course, they were impacted by the pandemic just as much as the rest of us were. But, they managed to adjust, the, the crofting partnership survived and it evolved to meet their needs. And the partnerships changed over the years, but it has allowed three people who would have not been able to do this on their own to enter into crofting, to build a rural business and to become an active part of a rural community. It's not just that individually they couldn't have afforded the 75,000 pounds for nine acres of croft land, but it was also about the support they offered each other. I was talking to one of them the other day and he highlighted that the mutual support, being able to talk to each other about development, to hash out ideas, to have somebody who understands what you're going through and crucially to hold on to that vision and dream when you are having a bad day, that was really important. And he said he would have never been able to do what, he, what this by himself, he wouldn't have been a profiter. This approach has allowed a single person someone who's part of a childless couple, and somebody who now also has a family to work together to create something of mutual benefit. So the next example, and then we're going to be very brief on this one, comes from Japan. So other forms of collaboration that could potentially help us maximise the contribution to crofting could include the kind of 
community level internship model that you see in some Japanese islands. This allows folk of all ages with an interest in food production to work with and learn from established local farmers. This is people of all ages. And sometimes people roll their eyes at this kind of initiative, thinking it's some kind of voyeurism that people want to come and try an alternative lifestyle. But actually, this project has had some success. It's helped individuals learn about food production, but also understand whether that path is right for them. And also, crucially, to develop a connection to place and the people that are there that's allowed them to feel our opportunities in the community. And this has led to people staying long term. Oh, my water's gone. So, moving back to Scotland, there are a number of initiatives in the community at a community level which are trying to sustain and grow populations in these areas. And I believe there's opportunities that we can learn from them in crofting. The Smart Clacken Project was the brainchild of Rural Housing Scotland and is developed into a partnership with Sturrus, Eust and Conbury Croft. And the pilot project in Eust, the project officer Donna Young, is working with the community of Loch Boylesdale on plans for a development which includes eight new homes, shared growing space, workspace and hopefully a boat shed. The homes will be sold under a shared equity model, which will make them affordable to local people, but also keep control, uh, retain a bit of control about how they can be used in the future. So they will <coughs> never become anything but primary homes. The flexible communal working space will include digital workspace for self-employed people and for those working from home, with the option for some studio or workshop space as well. And the communal areas will be managed by the local trust, and homeowners will have access to communal growing space for the households. It's hard not to draw comparisons between this project and crofting. Both provide for subsistence food production, work, housing, and an element of communal ownership and support. This is done on a much smaller scale than many crofts, but actually maybe that's more manageable for some people. I've got one final example to talk to you about. And this is a project in um, Orkney, uh, South Ronaldsey, uh, called Hope Co-Housing. It's a project that began with a collection of crafters. That's crafters, not crafters. <laughs> um, these women, who are all over the age of 60, recognised that they were reaching a point in their life where, they were, where their homes were becoming less suitable for their needs. Not only that, but they recognised that many of them were under-occupying their homes. And this was having an impact on housing choice and availability in the wider community. So they got together and made plans for a co-housing project in the heart of St Margaret's Hope, which could allow them to continue to live independently in old age while benefiting from the support of a shared community. These women are very clear about the fact that this co-housing project is about benefiting the community for the future as well as meeting their current needs. It's about freeing up housing now, but also making more housing available for an independent ageing population in the future. It recognises that older people are part of a balanced population and focuses on the concept of ageing well. Similarly to the Smart Clacken project, it includes shared growing areas, as well as options for working together in a wide variety of ways, such as sharing ownership of cars. You might wonder, what this has got to do with crofting. You might think it's strayed a little too far from crofting. But the fact of the matter is we have an ageing population and some of, who, some of the ageing population live in under-occupied croft houses. And they may not have the capacity as they get older to keep up with the latest developments to help them make the most of their land. Currently the system of crofting <coughs> is the idea that a croft supports a single household. What if is suggested by the Shucksmith report, a second house was available on the croft, which could be used to help smooth that intergenerational transition or allow people to downsize. It could also provide an option that, uh, for something that um, Shucksmith termed apprenticeship accommodation, allowing people the opportunity to both gain experiment, experience and understanding whether crofting is for them. And just to play devil's advocate, if two houses on a croft would be okay, why not three? 
or four in a kind of smart, small smart hacking project. Consideration needs to be given to make sure that we don't remove perfectly good agricultural land from crofting. But the croft houses where I live are rather large, with rather large spaces around them for vehicles and between it and the shed. If that space was used more efficiently, could we be, could we be creating more housing? That could have benefits in terms of cost savings, building together some kind of collective self-build, additional housing, and more productive use of the land because there are more people on the croft to work in. I'm the first to admit that there would be challenges with moving to a model which accommodated that kind of sharing of crofts. But just because something is challenging doesn't mean that we shouldn't consider it. Crofting was created to meet the challenges of the mid 19th century and it has evolved to an extent over the years, but it needs to continue to evolve if it's to remain a relevant and active part of sustaining communities in our rural and island places. The kind of communal approaches that I've been talking about today reflect the communal roots from which crofting grew. I suggest that they are culturally sensitive to the way that crofting communities work and they're worth considering when we think about the future of crofting. So, done a lot of talking there. What I'm gonna do in the moment is I'm going to ask you to controversially move tables. You're not going to stay on the tables that you're on. And I think, yes, I'll put up the tables in a minute. First thing I want you to do is I want you to pick one of these that you're most sceptical about. I'm going to do it the other way around. <coughs> There's one of these that you'll, at least one of these that you'll have gone, yeah, nice idea, but that's never going to work. And you're going to spend 15 minutes talking about the challenges that you think that would be faced, whether it's that it's not relevant, whether it's too difficult. Then in round two, we're going to swap tables again, and you're going to go to a table of something that you're like, hmm, there actually might be potential in that idea. And you're going to talk about the ch those, that potential, and you're going to address the challenges that have been put, put to you by the previous people on that table. Don't worry if you haven't fully understood that. The slides are going to be on the screen. So, 